Hello, everyone. I'm Sergei Radelian, a, a medical oncologist resident in Armenia. Today, we are diving into some exciting data in advanced solid tumors. Today, my guest is Dr. Michael Gordon, medical oncologist and clinical researcher at Owner Health Research Institute and a lead investigator on the C801 trial of botanzilimab plus bolstilimab. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much for joining me today. Sergey, a pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much. So today we are going to discuss your trial, and before we get into the numbers, could you please briefly set the stage? What was the C801 study designed to test, and why pair our next gene CTLA-1, CTLA-4 antibody with PD-1 blockade in this so-called tumors? Yeah, so uh, the study was the first phase 1B trial combining the FC-enhanced um, multifunctional CTLA-4 antibody botanzilumab with the PD-1 antibody Um This was a, a package of therapies from a genus designed to enhance anti-tumor immuno-oncology therapy. The CTLA-4 antibody has the ability to affect Treg cells in the tumor microenvironment, which by nature tend to suppress the immune response of typical immunotherapies. And that's part of what leads to the classical cold tumors, those tumors that are absent of clinically viable or effective T cell infiltration, and therefore oftentimes are devoid of response to classical immunotherapy. So this was a, a classical phase 1B dose escalation, looking at two different doses of botanzilumab with varying doses of bolstilumab, and we quickly ascertained what we felt were the effective and best tolerated doses, and then expanded cohorts. Um, some of them were planned. Others were based upon observations in the earlier phase of the study. All right. Thank you so much. Um, speaking about the population at the cohort, like who was included in this trial and why was this patient population, especially those with refractory solid tumors, were chosen? That's correct. So as a phase one, even though immunotherapies are commonly used across many different cancers, and we did explore patients that had classically hot or immunosensitive tumors, um, the focal point of the study was really taking advantage of the novelty of botanzilumab and its bio biologic effect. And so we chose to look at tumors for whom or for which immunotherapy is not classically an effective treatment. And that includes predominantly microsatellite-stable colorectal cancer, sarcomas, particularly soft tissue sarcomas, ovarian cancer. And these are three tumors for which there are generally not broad use of immuno-oncology agents. And then we also investigated those patients with non-small cell lung cancer and cutaneous malignant melanoma where um, we were identifying patients who had previously received immunotherapy and had progressed on or after immunotherapy, thought to then be a very difficult to treat subpopulation. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. And would you please like explain briefly, especially for those who do not know, how does botanzilumab differ from the first generation anti-CTLA-4 antibody? And why is that important for treating cold tumors? Yeah, so botanzilumab is an FC-enhanced um, anti-CTLA-4 antibody. And what that means is that it, changes its effect in the tumor microenvironment and targets cells other than the classical CD8 um, anti-tumor T cells. In particular, it affects the T regulatory cells, 
which are the counteracting cells against the immune response. In cold tumors, um, these T regulatory cells, which can be immunosuppressive, are elevated in their presence. And so botanzilumab, in addition to the classical effect of recruiting new anti-tumor CD8 cells and increasing their expansion, has the ability of reducing the T regulatory cells, kind of having a dual function towards the efficacy of anti-tumor immunotherapy. And this is important in traditionally cold tumors, where we believe T regulatory cells play a critical role in blocking that T cell benefit. All right. Excellent. And like you continue about the efficacy results, as you mentioned, what were the main efficacy results of the trial, specifically the overall response rate and the median overall survival? So we have a number of critical points. First, the, the confirmed overall response rate in these heavily pretreated, most patients had at least three prior therapies, but the median overall response rate was 17%. And the median um, disease control rate at six weeks or the disease control rate at six weeks was about two thirds of patients. Um, and uh, we view this as being a critical, critical benefit in patients who ultimately would not have had further effective treatments. We also found that of the two doses of botanzilumab, one milligram per kilogram versus two milligrams per kilogram, there was no difference in the overall response rate, 17% for both, but the one milligram per kilogram dose was better tolerated. And also, I know that the study observed the survival plateau at 24 months, which is like, which translates into 39% of patients alive. Why is this specific finding so significant for patients with advanced diseases who have run out of options? It's a great question. And of course, it's important to note that this is a single arm study, but it's an observation of clear efficacy of the immunotherapy producing what we would consider to be a very clinically significant 24-month overall survival of 39%, as you, no as you noted, the median overall survival in the entire population was just over 17 months. And for a refractory patient population who um, may not have effective treatment options, the use of this immunotherapy combination clearly not only demonstrated those benefits, but as you noted, a plateau on the curve suggesting that there may be patients who are achieving a durable clinical benefit, a hallmark of sensitivity to immunotherapy. Dr. Gordon, speaking about the adverse events, like what were the most common or notable side effects that you observed during your trial? Yeah, so, so this CTLA-4-PD-1 combination is a bit unique in that we predominantly saw GI side effects notably diarrhea and colitis, which occurred in roughly a quarter of the patients at the one milligram per kilogram dose level. It was higher, about 40% of patients having any form of diarrhea and grade three or greater colitis and diarrhea occurred in only 10% of the one milligram per kilogram patients but was double that, almost 19% um, in the two milligram per kilogram. Aside from the colitis, other common immunotherapy-related adverse events were minimal. Um, so we did see low levels of thyroid dysfunction, hepatitis, skin effects, and pneumonitis, pulmonary effects, but those latter three were in the range of only 2 to 3% of all grades. And in terms of more severe grade three or greater, only 1% of patients experienced 
um, a higher grade of toxicity. And that's very different than the classical CTLA-4 antibody combinations, which tend to have a broader range of higher degree toxicities. Uh, you mentioned that like immune-related adverse events were linked to better survival, right? Do you have any explanation uh, for this to a general audience? Yeah, so, so I think for immunotherapy, if you go back and look at the early days of tremolimumab and ipilimumab, it was clear that as we were working through the doses of those drugs, higher degrees of immune-related adverse events were in fact associated with better outcomes, including response rate and survival. So it's not entirely surprising, and I think it, it reinforces the immune-related effects that we're seeing. Of course, among the most important issues are that the immune-related adverse events seen were predominantly colitis, and because of an aggressive approach of using anti-TNF antibodies such as infliximab, we were able to limit the necessary use of steroids and therefore continue patients on therapy. So again, I think it's you can draw several conclusions. One is that similar to other immunotherapies, patients who develop adverse events are responding to the immunotherapy and as a result, generating an immune response that provides them benefit. But I also think that having learned from prior experience, we took a very aggressive approach to try and keep patients on schedule, on therapy with the use of TNF antibodies to treat colitis. And that may also have contributed to this improvement in outcomes associated with immune-related adverse events in that first 12-week interval, which was our cutoff. Thank you so much, Dr. Gotten. Also, I have another question about the cancer types and their response rate. So, did all cancer types in the pan-tumor cohort respond the same, or were there notable differences in efficacy across tumor types like MSCRC, sarcoma, and NSCLC? Yeah, so we've, we've subsequently published our data on colorectal cancer and on soft tissue sarcoma. We've submitted our data for ovarian cancer. And what I can say is, while not a, a large enough data set to be able to have absolute definitive um, statistical analysis, within the ability to interpret it in this study, it would appear that all three cold tumors, microsatellite-stable colorectal, ovarian, and soft tissue sarcoma, had similar response rates in that 17 to 20, 22% range. Certain subgroups of sarcoma, like angiosarcoma, had a higher response rate than other sub subtypes. But yes, we did see similar response rates across the broad range of diseases that we treated. You also like talked slightly about the heavily pretreated patients. I would also like to know about their outcome, like what were the outcomes for those who were heavily pretreated, those who had already failed several years of therapy? Most of these patients were heavily pretreated, the majority of whom had had more than three prior regimens or treatments for their disease. I think uh, among the things that we noted that were pertinent were um, heavily pretreated versus less heavily pretreated did not impact responses. And there has been a, a unique observation initially that suggested that patients that had liver metastases would not respond to treatment. In fact, while we found that patients absent of any liver metastases had a marginally higher response rate, patients that had active liver metastases still had. Um, a response rate of about 13%. And while disease control rate and median overall survivals were improved for those with no active liver mets, 
the 24-month overall survival for patients with Levermets was still approximately 30%. So I don't believe that we can make a determination that patients with Levermets should not be treated in these studies. In contrast, I would say we should have a realistic expectation that no liver meds may respond better. And there are some rationales for that based on the biology of liver metastases and macrophage phenotype of M1 versus M2. But, but importantly, we should not leave the interpretation of this study um, open to the question of well, people with liver match should not get immunotherapy. I would say that our data support continued investigation in that population. Thank you so much, Dr. Gotten, for your details and numbers. Also, um, I would like to know what the next steps in this clinical development of the botanicillimab and bolstilimab combination are. Yeah, so um, the, the phase three trial, um, which is named the Batman, B-A-T-T-M-A-N trial, is uh, scheduled to open. This is an international study comparing the combination of botanstilimab at the one milligram per kilogram, but actually at a fixed dose, and bolstilimab combination in patients with microsatellite-stable colorectal cancer against best supportive care. And it's anticipated that that study will enroll well because of the data that we've presented and uh, the novelty of what's being seen. As has been um, anticipated, less heavily pretreated patients may have a more intact immune system. And there are currently um, uh, clinical trials that are investigating this immunotherapy combination earlier in the course, including at least one study that's looking at de novo diagnosed metastatic disease patients who are receiving botensilimab and bolstilimab as unique therapy with close monitoring and chemotherapy at any point should patients show progression or lack of a response. So we're seeing that focus, but the expectation is that there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm across these cold tumors, across relapse refractory tumors, and we have great hopes that botensilimab and bolstilimab will add another potential value in the armamentarium of immunotherapy as we move forward investigating all of these diseases. Thank you so much, Dr. Gotten. I really appreciate your time and your commitment to explaining your data and talking about your new trial. I appreciate it a lot. Do you have anything to add that I didn't cover with my questions or something to share I, with wide opens? No, no, Sergey. I think you did a great job and I appreciate the opportunity to share the data, respond to your questions. And we look forward to uh, new data emerging regarding this combination and uh, advancing and potentially transforming the way we deliver care to specific groups of patients. Thank you so much, Nick. Looking forward to our next meeting. Hopefully, we'll interview about the upcoming data and new trials of yours. We'll look forward to that, too. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.